Good morning. Thank you for joining me here this morning. For those joining us on the live stream, want to welcome you. Uh, we are back uh, in person worshiping, so definitely want to welcome everybody in the room here with us this morning and let you know that you are welcome to come and join us uh, uh, probably a little late this Sunday, but definitely next Sunday we have um, a mask available. We're keeping the, the doors propped open. Everybody is encouraged to wear a mask. And we are, are socially distanced, so we do encourage you to, uh, if you feel comfortable, to come back and join us for in-person worship. Uh, big announcement this week, we will begin uh, in-person Sunday school uh, uh, for children next week. And also our Genesis Sunday School class will start in-person Sunday school uh, next week. Uh, so we already have some of our adult classes are already doing in-person uh, Sunday school, but uh, in-person Sunday school for our children and youth will begin uh, this next coming Sunday. So we hope you'll uh, make arrangements to be here. And again, we'll, we'll be doing, uh, encouraging everyone to wear a mask and, and social distance as best we can and uh, encourage everyone to come and join us live in person here on the campus. Uh, so we're going to begin our worship this morning uh, the way we normally begin our, our worship here in the contemporary service. We're going to pray. And then we're going to profess our faith. So let's stop and let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your blessings this morning. We thank you for the opportunity, for the privilege, for the gift of just stopping everything that we're doing. Stopping all the worrying and the trying and the work and the striving to stop and rest in your presence to cast our cares upon you and to trust you, to learn from you and to be equipped by you. So as we stop now in this moment, we pray that you would make our pres your presence known to us, both in this room and where we are scattered out across the county uh, watching this virtually. We pray that you would bless us with your presence and that uh, this moment will be a moment of equipping so that we might go forth in the rest of this week as your disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I ask you now if you will join me as we recite together uh, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, for those here in the room with us, I invite you to stand as uh, Logan and Chris come and lead us as we worship together in song.
Father, as we come here to your word, we come here in the name of the living word, your son Jesus. We pray as we study your word that you would make your word alive in us, that we might go out into the world and we might uh, show your love and your grace and your truth to others. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are continuing on in our series in the Minor Prophets, uh, looking at uh, each one, uh, one each week. And we're almost to the end of that series. We're on our next to last prophet. Uh, we're looking at the prophet Zechariah this morning. And we are in chapter 3 of the book of Zechariah. We're going to look at the first uh, 10 verses here in the prophet Zechariah. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along with me or open your Bible app. Uh, also for those of you following along uh, at home, uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And the prophet writes, Then he showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is, isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, See, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with festive robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head, and they clothed him in garments while the angel of the Lord was standing nearby. Then the angel of the Lord charges Joshua, This is what the Lord of armies says, If you walk in my ways and keep my mandates, you will both rule my house and take care of my courts. I will also grant you access among these who are standing here. 
Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your colleagues sitting before you, indeed, these men are a sign that I am about to bring my servant, the branch. Notice the stone I've set before Joshua. On that stone are seven eyes. I will engrave an inscription on it. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. And I will take away the iniquity of this land in a single day. On that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Guilty. Guilty, declared the opposing attorney. There he stood before the judge, pointing at the accused. His appearance would have never given away his true intentions, how evil they were. He was dressed in the finest clothes that fit perfectly and gave him an air that demanded respect. His hair was perfect. His face was handsome with, a, handsome with a youthful gleam in his eyes and a devilish smile. He spoke with great eloquence, expertly crafting the words of his accusations, making sure there were no contradictions and there were no loopholes in his reasoning. He spoke with a voice that was strong and clear and it filled the courtroom. The accused was guilty and there was no way he was going to weasel his way out of the insurmountable case that was being presented against him. The evidence against the accused was great and undeniable. There was no mishandling of the case. There were no technicalities that could be claimed and there were no details that had been overlooked. The accused was guilty and his accuser was seeking the maximum penalty. No mercy could be shown. No grace could be given, but the accusation made it clear that only the severest penalty would suffice in this case. After presenting the accusation with a speech that would be the epitome of any public speaker, the opposing attorney rested his case and he sat back with sadistic glee to see what kind of feeble defense the accused would offer. The accused was once a man of stature, a man of renown and, and power. He was an influencer before we even had that word, before there was such a thing. He was respected and revered. Now he stood ashamed. His stench filled the courtroom he stood there in uh, the worst rags, dirty, disheveled clothing when he was once used to wearing the finest of cloth, made from the finest threads. He was once adorned in gold and jewels, and now he stood there filthy in disheveled rags. The defendant could offer no defense. In fact, not a single word came out of his mouth. He heard the indictment and how persuasively it had been articulated. He could say nothing. He just stood there before the judge in shame. His accuser waited in delight in that moment of silence as the judge considered the case. He knew the judge would throw the book at this reprobate, at this wretch that stood before him. He was taken aback when the judge declared the defendant not guilty. The judge did not stop there. He publicly reprimanded the accuser. The judge said, Isn't this one before me an upstanding citizen who works to spread goodness the way a burning stick spreads fire? He offered the man, or he ordered that the man be given new clothes, fine clothes, and that he be restored to his former status. And there on the spot, the judge declared that this filthy wretch was clean. The accuser could not stand for this. This was a miscarriage of justice. It was unheard of. It was unfair. But it wasn't the first time this had happened with this judge. And it wouldn't be the last. So he set his sights on the judge. 
If the accuser was going to put a stop to this kind of nonsense, then he had to go after the man at the top. And it took some time, but one day he caught the judge away from the courtroom, away from the crowd, away from witnesses. He caught the judge in a moment of weakness, in a moment where he was vulnerable to attack, a moment when he was alone. The accuser wasn't going to get him out in public. That wasn't his style. He's much too smooth for that. So he caught the judge alone and he confronted him. He basically said, you're a fraud. You're a fraud and you know it. You claim to be high and mighty, but I know that you know you're a fraud. In fact, if you really are who you say you are, prove it. Use your power. Prove who you say you are. Show the world that you're not just some pushover or submit to me and I will keep your secret a secret. I will keep you in power and no one will know that you had this moment of weakness. The judge was weak. He was alone. But he didn't fall for this attack. He didn't become defensive or try to explain himself or his actions. He sent the accuser away, disappointed once again with one sentence. Get behind me, Satan. Disappointed once again, the accuser was not put off. If you really want to bring somebody down, if you really want to stop something that's more systemic, you need somebody on the inside. You need an informant. And it wasn't long before he found someone who was willing and ready, someone who would turn over the ringleader and to do it on the cheap. He would do it for only 30 pieces of silver. That's all it took for this insider who was close to the top to turn on his leader. And like any good cop movie, they raided him in the pre-dawn darkness. They came in and, and caught everybody off guard. But it seemed like the judge was not caught off guard, like he expected this moment to happen, like he knew it was coming. He didn't try to run or fight. He went willingly with the officers. He was tried in the court of public opinion. Even though the actual trial court could find no wrong with him, the public wanted vengeance. They wanted to bring down this judge who was not holding the guilty accountable, who wasn't upholding the law, and who was leading a revolution. And they got what they wanted he was beaten in the streets. He was paraded through town and was hung high on a hill outside of the city. Vigilante justice hijacked the legal system to bring down a heretic. He died so quickly that his supporters didn't have time to buy a grave for him, so they had to borrow one. The accuser was filled with the light. He had finally won. He thought he had changed the world and that he would now win in all of his indictments. Because you see, you and I stand before the judgment seat accused. The accuser has exposed all of our sins, and even those we thought nobody knew about, he has prepared an unbeatable case against us. He doesn't relegate his case just to the courtroom. No, he finds us when we're alone and we weak, and he whispers in our ears, that he knows we're frauds. We try to put on the good Christian front. We try to look all holy and righteous and make people think that we're good, but we know down deep inside we're not as good as we want other people to believe. You know, we'll do stuff like we'll, we'll tell people, I'll pray for you. Well, we get busy and we forget that. We believe in mission, but we think it's better for other people to do it. We, we, we cuss from time to time. We get angry, we hold grudges, we love gossip, we do all sorts of things we know the law says we shouldn't do. Even our best behavior is really just filthy rags when we stand before the judgment seat. But the accuser has not won. Guilty though we are, it is not the final word in our case. No, because we are forgiven. Because the judge still sits on the throne. He died, yet he lives. The judgment he passes on us is forgiven. 
He has given the order that we should be clothed in righteousness, washed clean and made new. He stretches out nail-scarred hands as He stands on peers' feet and He welcomes, them, welcomes us into His brace as He says, Child, come home. He calls out, My sisters and brothers, come and receive the inheritance your Father has prepared for you. He invites us as His bride to a wedding feast that will last for all eternity. He looks at us and says, Isn't this a burning stick from the fire? A brand plucked from the embers upon which I will pour out my spirit like gasoline and I'll set the world ablaze with my glory. In Zephaniah's vision, the accuser, Satan, could not win his case against God's high priest. In the wilderness, he could not lead astray God's only son and he cannot overcome you because in Christ we are more than conquerors. Yet so many believe his lies, that they are not loved, that they are not enough, that the next purchase, the next meal, the next indulgence, the next indiscretion, that will be the one to make them happy and make them whole. But it never will. No, we are made whole and clean and pure by the one who loves us and who is more than enough so we don't have to be. He has done everything necessary for our salvation. He has paid our debt. He has provided the cleansing sacrifice. He has defeated evil and sin and even death. He has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us and He invites us to be set ablaze with His love so that others might see the light of salvation. So will you hear the words of the Savior today? Your sins are forgiven. Now rise up and sin no more. I am with you always. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Will you receive the grace and forgiveness He offers? Will you lead other poor wretches just like yourself to His grace that they may too receive it? I ask you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we already stand forgiven. We already stand cleansed and holy and righteous in Your presence not because of anything we've done, but because of what you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and because of the Holy Spirit you've poured out upon us. We pray that you would keep our eyes and our ears open and alert so that we're not led astray by the lies that this world tries to sell us, the lies that the enemy puts out, that there's some better way or there's something else that might make us happy. We know that true happiness and true wholeness comes from a relationship with you. So we pray that you would let us grow in that relationship and that you would use us to bring others into that relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand to sing.
God bless you. May God keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.